Lord Dubs, or should I say my friend Alf, whom I've known for many years and we've worked together. How are you today? Because it's just been your 90th birthday and I want to know if you're still doing marathons. <laughs> well, not doing marathons, but I'm, I'm still going hill, hill, hill walking when I get the chance. Not so easy, easy in the winter. I'm fine today, yes. It's, it's been a good day. Everything, everything's going well. But you've been doing marathons politically for years and years. And when some people talk about having an age limit for the House of Lords, you contradict that issue because only a couple of weeks ago you were down at Manston uh, on the refugee issue and you've made many visits to Cali uh, on that issue. You're one of the kinder transport uh, children and has that experience stayed with you in life so that you were focusing on the refugee issues? It must have influenced me, either consciously or subconsciously, yes. One can't go through an experience like that at the age of six, uh, leaving home, uh, saying goodbye to my mother at the station and so on. I was lucky because, because in the end the family got together again. But yes, I don't think one can go through that sort of experience without it having some effect on one. Uh, and uh, my belief is uh, that I felt the issue of refugees was important then and is important now. And uh, it's important for those of us that have a chance to play in public life is to make use of our experience and, and to use it effecti as effectively as we can. <coughs> I had the privilege for a number of years in the 90s and working alongside you in the Northern Ireland office at the time of the peace process. Uh, and again, you were optimistic, engaging, and uh, all sides welcomed your presence and contribution. And indeed, our dear departed friend, May Blood, you know, uh, was a fixture in, in both of our lives. Uh, and she was from the Protestant side uh, of the community, Shankle Road, but she had great engagement uh, with others. What, what did the experience in Northern Ireland teach you, Alf? First of all, can I comment on May Blood? I think she was a wonderful person, one of the most effective politicians, although she might not call herself that, one of the most effective persons to come out of Northern Ireland with a passion and a commitment and ability, as you said, to work across communities. And I think one of the things I did learn in Northern Ireland was the need to work across communities in a situation like that, to look for consensus and to, um, and to um, as it were, say that if we, we've got to get on with this person, we've got to get on with that person, and we came in, I suppose we were lucky, you and I, and we had, we had painful and great times together. I think painful was the Omer bombing, for example, uh, but great times were some of the evenings we, in the evening we would discuss what happened uh, and some of the things you and I were both able to do in our respective responsibilities. So it taught me that. It also, it also taught me how to get legislation through, the peace process legislation. It taught me about the difficulties. It taught me about people who were here at this end, who are cowards and people who are brave, willing to stand up, and people who are not willing to be helpful. So I, I learned an awful lot. But I suppose in the main, it was how to get on with people. Uh, I knew, a, I suppose, a bit about Northern Ireland because I'd been involved in Northern Ireland in the Commons, so I'd been over a few times. But I, thi I think it taught, me, it taught me better still how to get on with people. And above all, people at all levels, in the local communities and, and at, at a more senior political level. All these things were part of our day-to-day day -day process. And I think it worked pretty well. And if people were a bit, um, uh, a bit, a bit of humour helps in Northern Ireland as well. You're talking about humour. You remember the all-nighters we had in negotiations at Stormont Castle. Yeah. Uh, and we'd one all-nighter uh, and uh, the tea bar was there. And I think there was a call for John Hume and John was a bit weary at the time. So he asked uh, the person at the back, who's calling? And the mouth went to the phone and they got the answer. And they came back to John Hume by saying, it's a Mr. Clinton. <laughs> 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 well, well it, was, it, was, it was a bit like that. I mean, when I was in Mo Molan, who was then Secretary of State, with, when we were there, Mullum's office, the phone kept going. It was Madeleine Albright from Washington and so on. It, it was a pretty busy place and, and a, a lot of the world was sort of, sort of coming in. 
I think my experience there uh, led me to a better understanding of culture and a change of uh, culture or approach by myself in the sense that we had to have consensus and ensure that both sides, uh, or all sides, actually had signed up to our proposals. Coming into the House of Lords, it seems to me that the culture in the House of Lords is a bit akin to the culture we were fostering in Northern Ireland. Is that uh, an I, accurate assessment? I think when you make a speech in the Commons, you're basically doing it for your own side or for, the, for your local constituency media. Um, when you make a speech here, there are quite a lot of people who aren't totally decided about the issue and who are open to persuasion. And therefore, we seek to persuade a quite chunk of members of the Lords who don't necessarily take the party whip, but who cost benches or independence, and we seek to persuade them. And I think that means one thinks about issues differently and one talks differently. And I think that's probably quite healthy in a democracy, mm -hmm. that, that, that our job is as much to persuade people that what we're saying is a good idea. So in a sense, the Commons, the representative, the report to the constituents, but we report to society, and are you describing it as more of a civil discourse in the House of Lords, uh, trying to engage, listen to people, and hopefully persuade. I think that's right. Uh, I always think of the crossbenchers, who are quite a large proportion of the whole House, and I think of them as people that we have to persuade, because if we lost them on an issue, it's not likely we, we can win. And so when I was a minister, you know, we were ministers together, uh, I was always so you are a minister in the Commons, but we're always seeking to persuade people to, to understand what we're doing. And there were some quite tense, tense situations. Uh, and don't forget, when I was a Northern Ireland minister here in the Lords, there were, I think, five former secretaries of state for Northern Ireland in the Lords. And these are people who really knew their stuff, who'd been in charge in Northern Ireland, and who had it all at their fingertips. And so that was pretty challenging, actually. What's your message for uh, young people? For example, I was a school teacher and I always used to try and encourage the young people to use their talents and I saw many of them with talents which I didn't have and I'd give my eye teeth for their talents and I didn't see them using it and that used to frustrate me. So I always used to say, when you got up in the morning, ask what you can do for others and use your talents and when you go to bed at night, retire, ask what you've done and make sure that every day is a good day uh, on that. What's your advice for young people? Well, I do it because sometimes I'm asked about my advice for, for refugees, but for young people generally, well, what I tend to say is go for it. Set your sights high. You may not achieve everything. Carpe diem. Yeah, that's right. Set your sights high uh, and, and, uh, and believe in yourself. And, and that way you can achieve more. I was very reticent. I didn't feel with my background as a refugee and English is my third language and so on. I didn't feel I could do that. It took me some time before friends persuaded me to set my sights at something, something a bit more ambitious. Uh, and it may not always work, but I think I would say to young people, don't hesitate. If there's something you, you feel you can do, go for it and do it and believe in yourself. I want them to understand um, about humanity I want them to understand about the, the need to be caring about our fellow human beings, whether they're living in a, in a war zone or whether, whether, whether they're impoverished li living in Britain. I want them to care about, uh, care about such people. Uh, I, I, I want them to feel that they're able to achieve things. I want them to feel that they shouldn't just sit back and, and, um, uh, and just let things happen. Uh, I think that they, they all have a responsibility to make things better. And, and they can, with, with a bit of luck, we all need luck, a bit of luck, th they, can help th they can help to achieve things. Look, if I can digress a second, Nicholas Winton, the man who organized the kinder transport from Czechoslovakia and saved me from the Holocaust, Nicholas Winton saw what was happening, and unlike many people who say, this is awful, and then walked away, he did not walk away. He actually said, I must do something. And that distinguished him from other people. And I hope that the young people to whom I would then be talking will also say that if they see something, they, they have a responsibility to act on it, not just to walk away, if they possibly can, to act on it and, uh, 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 and to do something positive. So I, 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 I think 
we, we have to be optimists, we have to believe in ourselves, and I'll say to young people, they won't make as much of a mess of the world as we have. Your time in the Lords, would there be something you missed in life uh, had you not been in the Lords, do you think? Uh, I think it's been a great privilege to be here, and it's given me a great sense that it's possible to do things here. <coughs> More than in the Commons, I think, a backbencher in the Lords can actually achieve things. If you know what you're about, and work hard to get it. And I think it's a great privilege. And so I, I feel there's a sense of, so satisfaction is a smug word, but there's a sort of a sense of- Fulfillment. A sense of fulfillment, yeah. uh, that one is able to do something and that it hasn't been a waste of his time, that one is here doing something which, which brings about change for the better. Yeah. Uh, Alf, uh, your time in the Commons, your time in the House of Lords, to me, it's been you serving the common good, irrespective of who you meet, where you meet them, and the benefits you've had from these institutions, I think is evident uh, in my experience of you, but also in our conversation uh, today. T tell me, in terms of that experience, what have been the highs for you? And what have been the lows? And how have you dealt with both? <laughs> that's, that's quite a, 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 quite a different comment. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me talk about the highs first. <coughs> well, I, I, I talk about uh, under two headings. <coughs> One is I felt that when I moved some amendments to government legislation, and those amendments eventually were passed. And here? Passed in the Lords, and the Commons hiccuped, came back to the Lords and, and then the government accepted them. I found that was a high. And one element of the high was public opinion heard what was going on. And I remember I was being shouted, I heard somebody shout in the street. And normally when it's politicians, it's abuse. But it wasn't abuse, it was saying, keep going with your amendment. And I found that the way public opinion woke up to some of the issues of child refugees helped to persuade, helped to persuade governments. And, and, and I think that, so I've always said, when we, whatever we do, we've got to bring public opinion with us. It's very important. Without public opinion, we can't, we can't win things. So that was, that was, that was one, one high. Another high was going to a refugee camp and meeting some of the young people who are volunteers, often but not exclusively from this country, who've given up a year or two of their lives to work with refugees, often in the most incredibly difficult circumstances in refugee camps in the jungle in Calais or on the Greek islands. And I found that both humbling and inspiring that young people can do such, young people from this country often can do such brilliant things. They don't get many accolades, they don't get much praise, but, but, but I found that pretty good. And another good thing has been, I think, when we got to the Good Friday Agreement and I was actually I thought our culmination of our time there and all the efforts, and here was something which hopefully will bring peace to the people of Northern Ireland, give them a chance to have the decent sort of life that we all expect for ourselves in, in Britain, but they also deserve it in Northern Ireland. So, so those were the highs. Oh dear, the lows. The lows were losing my seat in the House of Commons. That was, that was a bit of a low. It's, it's not a great thing to happen. You suddenly are on the job market and, uh, <laughs> and, and I was unemployed for a year, but there, there we go, that's how things are. Uh, I, I think uh, some, I have to say, I can't avoid being a bit party political. I have to say, when the Home Secretary talks about refugees as invaders, I find that deeply and personally upsetting. Upsetting because invaders are seen as an enemy. Invaders are hostile people. Whereas what we're talking about are people who are fleeing from war, persecution, uh, threats to their safety and so on. And I think we owe them a bit of compassion, not just that sort of hostility. So, so that, that, I that, is a, that is another low. And I'd strive in politics to have to overcome that. And when I'm talking outside Parliament and in Parliament, I try and argue the, uh, the an opposing case. You've been here quite a long time. What message would you give to people about your experience in the House of Lords? I think it's possible in the House of Lords to achieve things. And there's no point in being here unless one sets out to do that. Uh, absolutely no point in just, just saying, oh, it's great being in the Lords, and it's wonderful and all that sort of stuff. No, no, that's not good enough. I think the thing about the Lords is it's an opportunity. And I think one's job here, one's responsibility 
for being here is in fact to use it as an opportunity and to achieve things uh, and to achieve change. Uh, we, we've got to make a difference. And I think anybody who's in the Lords ought to be able to say, yeah, in that small way or that big way, I help to make a difference. And that I think will be the test of whether people are doing what they should be doing here or just sitting here doing nothing. Well, Alf, uh, thanks for coming in and chatting to me. Your life experience has been uh, fantastic. And I hope somewhere, sometime, the two of us can sit down for your hundredth and you tell me what you've done in the 10 years since we met now. So thanks very much. <laughs> well, thank you, John. Not sure about the last bit, but thank, you, but thank you very much. I've enjoyed the chat. I've enjoyed talking to you. Thanks very much. That's lovely.